to the United States. Most prominently, the targets to reduce greenhouse gases, excuse me, greenhouse gas emissions by 20 percent and to use renewable fuels for 20 percent of their complete energy consumption by the year 2020. But progress toward meeting many of these goals is uneven across member states. Some countries and cities are way out in front in designing and implementing innovative policies and technologies, while others are not. Their emissions cap and trade system is years ahead of the efforts that exist today at the regional level of the United States and is clearly on target to exceed uh, the, the given target of, of a 20 percent reduction by 2020, but it also faces now some very significant problems from which I hope uh, U.S. planners are, and they are endeavoring to learn. So their path is not so dissimilar from that of the United States, although they are surely farther along. The United States government, on the other hand, lacks a clean, comprehensive strategic energy plan and therefore a climate policy, a coherent climate policy. And this, at this stage, I think, of the game is frankly deplorable. But in the United States, some, some counties, some cities, and some states stand out for their initiatives to lower carbon emissions, for taking projected climate impacts into consideration in their planning and their infrastructure, and for laying the groundwork for broader diversity in energy and fuel sources. And the report mentions several of these and draws attention to them as best practice type cases. While, of course, as in Europe, in the United States, there are several cities, many states, that are lagging behind. Now, one component of this overall project was to conduct public outreach events at the levels of key cities across the United States. And I attended some of these events along with uh, several members of CNA's military advisory board. And at these events, we, uh, we held uh, public conferences like this and dialogues with, uh, with business leaders, with, with students, with uh, politicians, and with the overall community about these issues and about the themes of the report. And I was surprised in those meetings, and I know hearing the reports from uh, military advisory boards at meetings that, that we, to which I couldn't attend, that, they, uh, that we encountered not so much, or much less, say, entrenched skepticism than I expected about climate security and the need for government action to address these kinds of problems. Quite to the contrary, in these discussions, everywhere there are local companies and politicians, groups of people, organizations that are hard at work designing and testing new renewable energy or biofuels technologies and finding ways to try to bring those to market, or implementing urban design and wastewater methods that they learned from, uh, from visits or, uh, or from times they spent in, in Europe, or pu otherwise pushing ahead local, county, and state policies and making fuel diversity and renewable energy sources part of our national economy and landscape town by town. As usual, leaving Washington and seeing what is actually getting done out there was illuminating and, in this case, encouraging. And we tried to capture some of that information and we talk about some of those cases in the report. This insight and those experiences led us to emphasize in our policy recommendations not so much new ideas for top-down federal programs or incentives, partly because we think in the current climate in the United States this would be um, uh, asking a bit much. But more so, we tried to focus on uh, encouraging more information dissemination, more networking among towns and cities and counties and groups, including the private sector groups on both sides of the Atlantic, and more communication about these local level experiments and initiatives and efforts and successes in the United States and in Europe so that those who are committed and innovative and working hard in these issues can share and learn from one another more effectively and easily. There is much that could be done, we believe, effectively in terms of information sharing and networking that would not require new legislation or major efforts of that sort or expensive new executive programs. We do have a few recommendations that are aimed at our national governments and at the European Union Commission. Within the U Washington community, we call for planning staffs from across the executive, including especially the military, to include in their future scenarios analysis and their future planning realistic estimates for energy and fuel supply and demand given the types of projections that, uh, that we're seeing coming out of the, the climate modelers and the scientific community and the experts and, and the energy companies themselves, and realistic estimates about the costs of transport and logistical supply chains as they engage in their long-term strategic planning in order to capture these factors and plan for them more effectively. Similarly, public sector planners should incorporate and address the expected effects of climate transition in their designs for urban layout, their infrastructure, 
their building designs, and, and, and their plans for transportation and other major systems. The report mentions specifically the benefits to be won from greater information sharing between the U.S. military, which has several pioneering projects for energy efficiency and using biofuels, and U.S. companies and state and local governments who could benefit very much from these lessons. The study mentions U U.S. military breakthroughs like the Net Zero Emissions Program at Fort Carson in Colorado and the USS Macon Island, an amphibious type warship which is driven by a hybrid electric propulsion system and it's the first of its kind to be deployed with such a, with such a, uh, with such a motor. And there are several, su several more examples, both in Europe and in the United States, that the report mentions. Our last two recommendations aim to help address climate and energy security at the global level. Using the transatlantic community and its values, its standards, its practices as a platform for improved cooperation on climate security and resilience building in other regions. We call for transatlantic community to deepen its planning and its interoperability for humanitarian assistance and disaster response, given the ever-rising likelihoods of more frequent and intense storms and droughts in regions around the world. Ideally, these joint combined capabilities will eventually be institutionalized within uh, a working system such as NATO or the United Nations, similar to its peacekeeping operations, and broadened, of course, to support valuable contributions by other nations around the world. But we could begin with the transatlantic community and NATO, for example, as a platform for these larger efforts. We also recommend that the European Union and the United States create new initiatives to try to expand what are existing bilateral programs for cooperation on science, technology, and ind industry related to new energy and fuel sources into multilateral cooperative programs to include rising industrial powers and technological powers such as China, India, Japan, and Brazil. Now that's a brief summary of the report and uh, with that I believe I'll conclude with the hope of leaving uh, plenty of time for my, uh, for my colleagues here on the panel to comment and to expand on these issues uh, from their own unique perspectives as policymakers and as practitioners. And I urge anyone interested in these issues to pick up a copy of the report, if there are any left, and, uh, and I, I think there should certainly be copies of the one-page summary available here this morning. And uh, more importantly, for anyone who's here on the webcast or couldn't be here this morning, um, and for yourselves, if you could visit our site at www.cna.org, and you can download as many copies as you wish. Thank you for your attention, and we look forward to the discussion. Should be on. Go ahead. All right. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Rear Admiral Neil Morissetti, who is now serving as the UK's Foreign Secretary's Representative for Climate Change, a post he's held since the beginning of this year. Prior to that, he had 37 years in the Royal Navy, during which time he commanded ships of many types. And uh, one of his uh, prior posts, his last assignment, uh, in which I met him was as the UK government's climate and energy security envoy, where he had basically what in Washington we call sort of an interagency coordination role, or many bosses, or as we say, if you have many bosses, you really have none. Um, <laughs> so he got to work for uh, the Foreign Commonwealth Office and Ministry of Defense and uh, um, DEC, which is your USAID equivalent, right? The Development Energy Agency. Energy and Climate Change. Energy and Climate Change. Okay, there we go. And um, so he's been a real leader in this field uh, globally and a great partner uh, with CNA, and he is the logical um, representative of this transatlantic partnership. So over to you, Neil. Terry, thank you. And you, you bowled me out in one. Three bosses, I'm always in the other department. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Ralph has given not just a brief but a very comprehensive um, description of this report. Um, but thank you for allowing me to join you this morning. Uh, for what I think is an important event. Roger, thank you. I'm delighted to be back at the Wilson Centre. I'm delighted I'm not being grilled by a television camera just standing <laughs> there. Um, but I suppose continuing this theme of our children, um, you be, wish to be aware that uh, President Wilson's influence got far further than just these shores. Um, I have a 21-year-old son who's majoring in international politics at the University of Aberystwyth under the Woodrow Wilson chair. Mm. Yeah. I would like to say... He's really interested in this. <laughs> but I've got to say, it's rugby and beer. 
And I probably can't blame him because I think he inherited it from me. And when I was studying environmental sciences at university, it was rugby and beer. <laughs> um, I want to thank CNA and Brucey and Toby. If you're out there, I understand you really are adapting to the Australian way of life. Um, <laughs> but also to Christian as a representative of the European Union for making it happen. Because I welcome this timely report. It's timely because I think we're at a watershed at the moment. We are in the most prolonged economic downturn that anyone can remember, certainly back to the Depression and probably before that. We've got real pressure on key natural resources, food, water, energy, and land, global pressure, and particularly, which affects our countries, on the energy piece. And we've got what's going on with the changing climate. We've got the science reinforcing the message We've just passed 400 parts per million for CO2. There's lots of work coming out. It'll come out in the IPCC's fifth assessment report later this year and over the next 12 months. But much more importantly, we've got what Ralph described, what we can see out of the window, what's happening with that changing climate, the extreme weather events, what the tractor driver sees every time he looks out the window, what's changed, uh, the melting ice, all of that, which gives us a pressing issue. And we've done some things, but what we haven't got if I can use the words of Winston Churchill, we haven't got action this day. We are at best distracted. At worst, we're complacent. Uh, perhaps we need a kick up the backside. Perhaps we need a wake up call. And I would suggest that this report just, just does just that. It advocates that we refresh, redirect our thinking to think about the context today as much as when the 2007 report was produced by CNA, that seminal piece on national security and the threat of climate change. Whether it's domestically, whether it's on our respective continents, or whether it's global, and it is definitely a transatlantic issue. It also describes what we can achieve if we work together, which is much more than the sum of the parts, or sorry, the individual parts. It talks about what my boss, William Hague, Secretary Kerry's opposite number, considers to be the biggest foreign policy challenge of the 21st century, the impact of a changing climate. But it talks about it importantly as a mainstream issue, not a niche issue which is for scientists, negotiators and readers of certain journals, a mainstream issue that talks about the impact and the risks posed to economic resilience and national security. And that's a message for government because all of us when we vote, we vote for a job and our safety and our well-being those two issues. And it, particularly it talks about it in the context of energy. It highlights what's been done and who's played a part in that. And I just want to focus on the, the two M's, the mayors and the military. <laughs> Go around the cities, in Europe, America, and I'll come back to that in a minute, and you'll see a lot being done by mayors to make things forward. It's not done for altruistic reasons. It's done for the benefit of their electorate, whether it be economic, health, or whatever. And the military, military on both sides of the Atlantic, do not do fads. But they do worry when they can see issues which are going to stop them delivering their outputs. The UK, DOD, NATO nations, our military have recognised that the way we've been using energy in the past is not sustainable. Business as usual doesn't work. The 22 gallons per man per day being used in operations doesn't work. And they take an action to address that. They've done it in the context of improving their military effectiveness, their outputs. They've done it to reduce risk, and they've done it to reduce cost, particularly pertinent today. But outputs, risk, and cost, that applies to everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a military, a business, or a family. It's relevant. But as I said, I think we need to do more. All of us need to do more, whether it's government, business, or civil society. And it's us, those three groups, working together. It's a new model, it's new actors, it's new ways of working, both domestically and internationally. The UK, and here I'm talking as a member of the European Union, part of Europe, if we look at climate change, quite clearly, high on our agenda, is getting a globally legally binding treaty in 2015 to address the impact of climate change. It's not going to be a pretty treaty, it's not going to be beautiful vellum, signed, cross T's, dotted I's, a working treaty that lets us get on and do that. That's through UNFCCC. But we also need complementary activity to give momentum to that UNFCCC process. 
uh, whether it's through the G8, the G20, the MEF, uh, or issues like ICAO's work at the moment on aviation emissions. Complementary activity that, that supports that process, the UNFCCC process. We need to make sure our narrative is relevant and resonates with our audience. One that's based on facts, not only talks about the downside of risk, the threats, it talks about the upside, the opportunities. Not least, it explains how you can have sustained economic <coughs> growth with a low carbon, clean tech, energy effective economy. And we need the right storytellers who will relate to that story to their audience. Because there are three steps if you want to make progress. We need to understand the challenge and the opportunities. We need to be able to take it on a national, a local, or regional basis and see the benefits, and then we're prepared to commit wider, ultimately at an international level. And on energy, quite clear, we need secure, sustainable, and affordable supplies. That's why we have an energy bill going through the United Kingdom at the moment. It finished in the House of Commons, or third reading on Monday. It's now passed to the House of Lords in order to meet our energy needs of the future, a strategic approach. Now, some of that we'll do on a national basis. Some of that we'll do as a member of the European Union. Some of it, perhaps, we should be doing on a bilateral basis with our bilateral partners, and in particular, the US, United Kingdom. This, in my mind, is an area where the United Kingdom can fulfill what people look for it to do as part of Europe and that transatlantic relationship. Last year was the 200th anniversary of when we stopped fighting each other. Since then, we have fought together to meet the challenges we face. They've taken many forms. Addressing this is one of the challenges of today and the future, and we'll be much better if we work together. Our leaders need to do it. Our senior politicians, Secretary Kerry, Foreign Secretary Haig, our military need to do it, and we need to do it as well as part of NATO. But all of us in this room also have a part to play in that process. There is a good story to tell. We're just not very good at telling that good story. Um, as many of you know, in the last three or four years, I've been very privileged to go around, I think, 25 of the United States states, a lot of the time in the company with members of the CNA MAB, who, who steered me out of sleazy bars and other places and, and focused <laughs> me on the task. <laughs> and when I go around at state, regional, and local level, and reiterating what Ralph said about this report, I see mayors, I see governors, I see citizens who've done a huge amount, a lot that could put many European cities and countries to shame. But there's a reluctance to tell that story. It needs to be told here in America. It's not unique, by, that by the way, that reluctance. I see it in Europe and other countries as well. It's a story that needs to be told when people are worried about other issues, that they understand this and the benefits. And it needs to be shared. And the ideas and the technology need to be shared, because that's how we're going to make some progress. We've got to be prepared to tackle the difficult issues. And we've also got to recognize when we see false storms, because they are just that, false storms. But above all, we all need to show leadership in this issue. And if we do, and the sort of issues that are highlighted in the report, then not only will we reduce the risk posed to our economic resilience and national security, but we're going to enjoy the benefits as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I commend to you this report, and I've written action this day on it to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil. That was uh, excellent and uh, really teed it up just perfectly uh, for our next speaker, Dan Chu, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, a uh, post he's held since 2012. Uh, in that position, he's responsible for strategy development and strategic planning. Uh, and as I, I mentioned, it, it doesn't anywhere in his title say, energy, environment, and climate change. But among the uh, considerations I know he takes very seriously, because about a year ago we spent a week uh, in Europe traveling uh, on a delegation to address these issues, um, are energy, climate change, and uh, environment, and uh, natural resource security. And he's made it a central part of the work uh, of the Department of Defense in such fundamental strategy documents as the Quadrennial Defense Review. Uh, so we're, we're very pleased that we could lure him out of the building for a little bit of time, because we know he spends much too much time uh, in the Pentagon these days. 
And uh, Dan, thank you very much for being a partner here with us and for being here this morning. Sure, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me uh, here for this discussion. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you, Sherry and Roger, for inviting me. Uh, don't need a lot of temptation to get out of the Pentagon, but I appreciate uh, <laughs> this opportunity. Uh, on the other hand, it's tough putting me to speak after Ralph and, and Neil. I'm very tempted to say, so they've said everything. I'll sit down and we can just uh, discuss a little bit more. But let me give you just a few thoughts from the U.S. Department of Defense uh, perspective, maybe to seed the discussion a little bit more. Uh, and then I do look forward to, to speaking with you all and, and hearing your perspectives uh, on this. I'll go back to what Sherry's been saying about me uh, so far. It's all true. Uh, my uh, title has the word strategy in it, but not environment, climate. Uh, or uh, energy uh, in it. Uh, but that said, my job is to do strategic planning uh, for the Secretary of Defense. Strategic planning, from my perspective, is really important, uh, not only because it takes into, a concern, uh, into consideration longer term uh, objectives and, uh, and approaches for the Department of Defense, and obviously we need to link that uh, to our resourcing decisions, but also balancing that against near term uh, needs. That is one of the fundamental tensions uh, in the job that I uh, do as I deal with quite a lot large uh, and diverse uh, bureaucratic organization, uh, not just at, uh, in the Pentagon, but as uh, DOD as a whole. Uh, and that's where these issues really and truly uh, do come in. Uh, these issues uh, f uh, f uh, form both near-term and long-term uh, interests for us, and my job is to try and find a way uh, to work those into, as Sherry has said and as Neil has said and as Ralph has said, uh, into planning. And I want to talk to you about why I think that's so important in just a minute. Let me first by just touching, uh, start by touching on the two uh, subjects at hand, on energy uh, and uh, how we think about that in the Department of Defense. And I'll use the same near-term, long-term uh, kind of frameworks that I've been using uh, already with you. Uh, initially, we think about this as an operational or a near-term, almost tactical uh, issue. Many of you will know uh, that we have established for the first time an Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy for exactly that purpose because, as Neil so eloquently put it, this is an issue uh, of output risks and costs for us. Uh, output in the sense that we can do more with our capability, if uh, with our military capabilities, if they are more efficient and based on sustainable energy uh, sources. We can minimize risk, and that's a very tactical uh, and sometimes very near-term issue, particularly as we think about things like logistics lines, and we've seen the risk to those logistics lines over the past 10 years uh, in military operations. And we can minimize costs uh, as we look more and more uh, at the cost of maintaining our operations. In the past, quite frankly, we didn't, simply did not factor them in. Our view was when we were at war, we would bear those costs. However, as we've started to appreciate the nature of the kinds of military challenges we face, we've realized that that's not a sustainable approach either from a budgeting or planning perspective. Strategically, we think about energy as well, and that's where my office uh, comes in. And here, I'm thinking a lot in particular about the strategic environment and how energy uh, can actually change, energy availability can actually change uh, that strategic environment. In particular, I'm looking at uh, impacts on geopolitical and, uh, relationships uh, based on changes in energy markets, energy reliance, energy sources, uh, and the types of energy uh, we use. These are very critical for us as we think long term about the kinds of futures we have to plan for as the Department of Defense, not because we necessarily want all of these futures to take place. As you can imagine, from a defense standpoint, we end up thinking a lot about the challenges and not as much about the opportunities as, quite frankly, I think we should, uh, but because these are important for us not only for planning from a capability standpoint, but also then identifying things that we want to avoid, things we want to prevent, things we want to see not happen as opposed to things that we think will deterministically happen. All of this uh, results in approach that we like to think of as emphasizing resilience on the part of the Department of Defense. Resilience, again, both in an operational sense, our ability to use our capabilities in a resilient manner. So for example, again, efficient, sustainable, sometimes distributed energy uh, sources are really critical for that type of resilience, and strategic resilience for us, energy independence, and our ability to anticipate and prevent uh, crises based on changes in uh, the energy environment. On climate change, likewise, I take those two uh, perspectives into account. In the near term, uh, we have a number of issues that we need to uh, manage and mitigate with regard to climate change. Uh, we have folks in our, uh, in part of OSD uh, that are dealing quite actively and uh, quite extensively uh, on mitigating things like uh, sea level change, 
uh, for our various military institutions in the United States uh, and abroad. Uh, these are quite significant issues for us. We're seeing significant impact. Uh, some of the most stark uh, examples of that are to some of our and our, uh, our uh, brethren in the Coast Guard installations up in uh, Alaska. We're seeing some really significant changes there that have to be uh, dealt with immediately, uh, but also in other areas where we are anticipating significant changes, and they will result in some changes in uh, the way we operate uh, and the way we even uh, um, uh, configure those particular uh, installations. So many of these are very near-term uh, issues. Again, in the longer term, we're also thinking about how climate change will affect the strategic environment. I, in particular, am thinking very hard. Already we've mentioned the potential for increasing need for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief type operations and as such, we're reaching out to our allies and partners around the world uh, to think harder about how to anticipate those and how to develop the shared capabilities and combined capacities uh, to manage those more effectively over time. But I'm also thinking about, again, from somewhat of a more geopolitical standpoint, what the impact could be on food and water scarcity, what the impact could be on mass migration, what the impact could be on stability uh, in various parts of the world. And again, how we as the Department of Defense need to think about it, not again because we desire any of those. Uh, to come about, but frankly, so we can play our part in preventing uh, those types of uh, negative uh, scenarios from uh, emerging in the future. So all of that gives you at least a, a quick sense, and I'd be glad to talk about any of them in more detail with you all, of how we think about that in the de department in both the near and the long term. What I do with that next, as I mentioned earlier, is I try and build that into our planning processes. So as you can imagine, in a, in a department as big as ours, with a budget that is as big but quickly shrinking uh, as ours, and in one where we have a both tradition and frankly a need to do uh, fairly long-term uh, planning, uh, the key is how do we incorporate all of these uh, different events. Uh, the longer term piece is uh, fairly straightforward. We do a lot of scenario based planning in the department and one of my, uh, I, one of, what I view as one of my primary jobs is to ensure that these types of issues are well considered in those future scenarios. The near term has been tougher because uh, it's very tough to deal with kind of current capabilities, current operational needs, and still trying to think a step or two ahead in terms of how we can improve that. But again, we've established, uh, and again, ASD uh, for operational energy is a good example of it, very tangible ways to work that into our current requirement system. Uh, so uh, Sharon Burke, who works that portfolio, is very actively working energy considerations into current acquisition uh, requirements, <laughs> into current testing and evaluation uh, types of requirements. So really trying to adjust ourselves uh, in the near term as well. All of this, as I mentioned before, is happening in a backdrop of shrinking uh, budgets, not just for the United States, but quite frankly uh, for all of us uh, in the transatlantic uh, uh, relationship. This has made this an extremely difficult job because this is not a matter of adding new requirements. This is a matter of prioritizing uh, our requirements. And as you can imagine, in a place like the Department of Defense, this is a very tough fight to keep these types of priorities on the table. But I can tell you again that from my perspective and what I view my job as ensuring that these types of longer term, broader, strategic types of issues maintain, are maintained as priorities even in tough fiscal uh, environments. These types of issues traditionally, and these are not the only ones, are very easy to ignore under tough budget uh, times. People are prone to do short-term savings and take longer-term risks because that's where uh, the numbers seem to add up right. Uh, but we have put a strong emphasis, uh, past Secretary of Defense is from Secretary Gates to Secretary Panetta, and I believe you'll hear the same shortly from Secretary Hagel, have really emphasized that essentially we should not cut off our nose despite our face. It is very important for us to maintain long-term uh, interests and priorities even as we face these near-term uh, budgetary constraints. I won't kid you, it's going to be tough, especially with the way sequestration is currently facing us. The specific way in which sequestration uh, is intended to be executed really forces people to look for short-term cuts rather than maintaining long-term uh, objectives. Uh, but in the department, I can tell you, we are trying very, very hard to do that, and that is uh, at the heart of the job, my job uh, at this particular time. 
There's another reason, though, for, uh, from my perspective in my job, I think this is very important, uh, and I'm hoping this will survive budget uh, constraints as well. And it is quite frankly that I think the types of security challenges we're talking about here, some of the things I outlined uh, earlier, are quite frankly uh, uh, emblematic of the types of security challenges we will be facing uh, in the future. These are not traditional military on military, state on state types of security challenges that the U.S. Department of Defense is quite accustomed to and has a long history of thinking about. These are very different types of challenges that quite frankly cross a number of boundaries. Not all of them are necessarily going to be state based. Not all of them are even going to be centered in a specific region, particularly not a region as we have defined it. Uh, not all of them will involve just state entities. Many of them will involve non-state, as in uh, people, as in non-governmental organization, as in businesses, uh, as in lots of other types of entities other than the traditional state entities uh, that we normally uh, deal with. As such, in as much as this is, an, uh, frankly, a, a stark example of the type of security challenge that we're going to face in the future, to me, it's absolutely important that we remain focused on these types of challenges as we think about how we in the department, and then frankly, we as part of the U.S. government, uh, tackle these types of challenges in the world uh, to meet our broad national interests. So we're working very hard on things that you've heard many times before, I'm sure, interagency reform, interagency collaboration and coordination to get a better handle on these types of challenges because DOD, not surprisingly, can't deal with these challenges alone, nor should we. Uh, and we not only need the help of other agencies, in many cases, uh, perhaps in most cases, we are helping uh, other agencies in this respect. We as the U.S. government also need to get better uh, at coordinating and collaborating with non-governmental uh, entities. As I mentioned before, sometimes these will be social or cultural groups. Sometimes these will be NGOs. Sometimes these will be public-private uh, types of partnerships. Again, I think particularly in this audience, all of those make perfect sense. But please understand, the U.S. government is simply not structured or accustomed to dealing in that way. And there's a lot of work to be done uh, in that regard. It's not through resistance. It's through... Uh, structural, I guess the way I'd put it is not through policy resistance, but through structural resistance, and we need to work our way through that. Finally, because as I said, I don't think any of these issues uh, tends to stay terribly localized in, in any way. Frankly, they tend to uh, be globalized. Certainly, climate change and energy issues are by definition uh, global issues. We have to work more with allies and partners uh, around the world. So thinking internationally and globally about these challenges uh, are critical. And here's where I want to touch on uh, the trip that Sherry mentioned earlier and how I think in particular uh, this plays into uh, transatlantic, transatlantic uh, cooperation. Uh, we went out last year and talked a little bit about what I just told you about, and I talked a lot uh, to uh, partners in Germany, in the EU, in the UK, and elsewhere about the kinds of ways we work this into our very specific planning processes and how we use it to make choices uh, in terms of prioritization uh, and resourcing. And we learned a lot from our European partners on how they're addressing uh, this as well. So I do hope we can continue to con collaborate on those because I think this uh, essentially weaves these issues uh, into our processes in a way that will foster the kind of active, uh, uh, the kind of action that we need uh, between <laughs> ourselves uh, to then cooperate and collaborate in more operational uh, ways. Until we've actually woven these into our planning requirements, into our approaches, and into our resourcing decisions, we may find some nice symbolic ways to act together, but I'll argue the roots of them will be rather shallow. We need to work this into all of our planning processes. I think that's quite critical. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for this. Uh, I was very encouraged by talking to the EU about how they're thinking about this in a longer term uh, perspective. I was just at a conference yesterday as NATO thinks about its role uh, in the future and we had a very interesting discussion about whether NATO should become a global versus a regional uh, alliance and my comment was NATO doesn't have to become a global alliance per se but NATO has to oper operate in a globalized environment and that's what I would argue is really the key for all of us uh, to think about again uh, and I think Sherry said this early on we are in a globalized context these issues are the epitome 
of globalized security challenges that we all face. And if we can't find a way to deal with this again across nations, across agencies within our nations, and then across this governmental uh, to private or social uh, boundaries, we will be unable to fully tackle these. So that's something that we're working very hard on. DOD obviously is a very, very small part of that, uh, but we think it's important that we are a part of it. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion that we're going to have here today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dan. That was uh, brilliant and insightful, as usual. Uh, we wouldn't be here today without uh, the, the leadership and uh, commitment of Christian Bergsmiller and the EU, so I want to pay a special tribute to uh, Christian. And uh, thank you very much uh, for what you've done to make this whole project possible. And it took some strategic foresight on your part when uh, we were working on, on the concepts for this <coughs> well over a year ago to put all these pieces in place. And uh, you've been uh, with us throughout, Christian. You have been, uh, since I've had gotten to know you these last couple of years, you've shown some real uh, leadership and innovation in the EU and, and traveled around the U.S., various, uh, seen various parts of our, uh, of our country and deepened the collaboration of the EU and the United States on transatlantic uh, energy and environmental issues. So thank you very much. Uh, he's got a great background, just the perfect person as a, an EU diplomat, having had many uh, different positions already, uh, working in different directorates in the EU to provide leadership in this area. So thank you very much, uh, Christian, for being with us this morning. Thank you very much, Sherry, Roger. Thank you very much to the illustrious panel. Um, one of the big advantages and disadvantages on working on that issue of the energy climate security nexus is to work with Rear Admiral Neil Morissetti, the big disadvantage is that I always come after him on every panel <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody says oh there comes poor Christian what is, <laughs> what is he going to tell us now uh, the great advantage is that and you saw it today again Neil is certainly the most gifted European speaker we have uh, on the energy and climate security issues and then isn't there anything better than to have a representative of the UK government who says exactly what the EU wants to say? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so there, there's really nothing on, on policy or, for that matter, preference uh, for beer that uh, <laughs> we could put between the two of us. I think the only thing would be rugby. Uh, when I look back at my university days, it's definitely beer and soccer. But I think this is a sort of, <laughs> this is a sort of minor difference. And uh, given that we are uh, running a little bit short of time here, and I mean, you should have the opportunity to, to ask questions, and I think we have set aside about 30 minutes for that. Let me just focus on, on one issue and come back to the, to the first sentence of the, the one sheet summary, where it says here, energy security and climate security are two sides of the same coin. Or we could also say energy policy and climate policies are two sides of the same coin. And the European Union has made that very clear when we adopted a couple of years ago, our energy and climate package, uh, already by that name, which contains those famous 2020 goals. And I still think it's one of the great marketing stunts of the European Union to call it the 2020 20 by 2020 package, sort of, at least in policy circles, it has a, some sort of value of recognition. And, and the European Commission has proposed to, to go even, even further, has proposed a, a roadmap to the decarbonization of the European economy by 2050. And I think this, this is important to keep in mind. With all the changes that are currently happening uh, in the energy field, especially the fossil fuel revolution here in the US, the shale gas, the tight oil, uh, which certainly helps us uh, a good deal in the in the short run. I mean, the switch from nat uh, from coal to natural gas in power production certainly has brought emissions uh, down on the U.S. side. So any switch from coal to natural gas 
the possibility to use natural gas in, in transportation that is currently explored. But we should not leave sight of the issue that all those measures only bring us a certain part of the way when it comes to dealing with, with climate change, a global issue. And as Re-Admiral Morissetti has quoted his minister, the biggest uh, foreign policy challenge of the, of the 21st century. So what I would, just the one message that I would leave with you today is energy and climate are joined at the hip. And whatever we think about doing on the energy side, we always have to keep in mind how that affects our climate policy. And with those remarks, looking forward to your questions. And you can direct them all to Neil. <laughs> <laughs>
David Mickle, director of the Environmental Security Program at the Stimson Center here in Washington. Uh, my congratulations to all of you for uh, an excellent panel uh, and also for the extreme economy of PowerPoints. I think that's the only <laughs> conference I've been to in years where there's only been one slide. The two <laughs> quick questions uh, that uh, touch on uh, a number of themes uh, addressed by all of the speakers. First quick question. Um, both on the European side and on the American side, uh, we heard about the innovations uh, and the new strategies taking place at the local level, the, the, the mayors, the cities, the, the town halls, the states. But we need to get that story out. So first action for this day question, how do we tell that story better? Do we need to speak louder? Are we not hitting the right audiences? How do we get that story out? Second quick question, uh, also addressed by all of the speakers, uh, collaboration, uh, the structural reforms, the interdependencies, the complexities of working across sectors, between agencies, uh, between governments. Uh, we've heard a lot about that on our side uh, of the issue uh, in the United States, in the European Union. Uh, the term of art in the US is the whole of government approach. But as also many of you pointed out, the security risks are often occurring in other parts of the world the sea level rise in Bangladesh, the food security issues uh, in the Sahel, the water scarcity issues in the Middle East. If we are going to collaborate with partners in those regions, how much whole of government do they need to be? How much cooperation uh, between sectors, between departments, does there need to be on the other side uh, of the table in order for this global cooperation to be effective? Great, thank you. We have another question here. Thank you. Uh, David Burwell, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, several of the panelists mentioned the, the fact that uh, America has this new oil and gas abundance. Uh, I, a mixed blessing, of course. Um, and I think Ralph pointed out that in light of this new energy, uh, the United States has basically no strategic energy plan. I think you mentioned, used the adjective deplorable. Uh, if you, if, for, this, for any of the panelists, if you had 15 minutes with the President and he has the right to set a strategic energy plan uh, for this nation, how would you recommend that President Obama would respond to this new energy abundance in a manner that was consistent with our strategic climate goals? Okay. We have another question. Hi, uh, Duan Nam from uh, U.S. Uh, Korea Institute at SITES. My question is related to Asia, and then Asia has been very important in many ways, but now China is the largest producer of CO2 emission, and then I'm just wondering what do you see in Asia? Do you see competition, conflict, or maybe cooperation in the long term? Great, thank you very much. So we have some really good questions on how do we tell the story, what do we need to do, what does it mean for collaboration in other parts of the world, um, what recommendations would you have for President Obama on a strategic energy plan given abundance, and then Asia, how does Asia fit in? So um, who would like to start? Hmm? Are these on? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, and thank you for those questions. Um, let's start with sort of how do we get the story out. I think, firstly, you've got to encourage people. You've got to go around and say, look, that's a great story. Now, why haven't you told anybody? But it's easy to say that. You've actually got to get people to do it. Um, one of the things we've certainly done with the team from the British Embassy in America is trying to provide some venues for people to tell those stories. Uh, a group of businessmen together, or a group of academics, or uh, some mayors, or whatever, um, and then try and broaden that. And it's something I do a lot of in the United Kingdom, going around and saying, finding out the people who've got the good stories, encouraging them to roll their sleeves up and get on the, on, on the soapbox and talk about it, um, and make it in a fashion that people can understand and relate. Because it's very easy to produce at, at government level some very broad statements which have to cover a, a multitude of issues and don't delve down to the piece that's relevant to the, to the community you're talking to. So the, the, there's that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, as Dan very clearly pointed out, that governments have to evolve, they have to understand they're going to work with new partners. So do overseas, the, the, the recipients of some of that work and some of that understanding. Um, and that's the part where I think we can help a great deal. You know, the experience we've gained, there's a long way to go in, in, in a more, I, I describe government is traditionally in stovepipes, 
We're not going to get them horizontal, but we need to get them through 45 degrees. We need to find some more doors that they can talk to some other people, whether it's a business community or civil society. And we need to understand how you have that dialogue and how best to do it. We've learned a lot, I think, from the experiences in operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, where we've brought them from just a military through um, state, uh, foreign commonwealth office, international uh, development, USAID and others. Um, we need to build on that and on that side. With, with the president, I would say you've got to look at this as a real opportunity, but not one that should be wasted. You've got to think about your strategic energy strategy. Um, I think it's got five strands. It's got use less energy efficiency. It doesn't matter what sort of energy you're using, use less. Have a diversity of types of energy. Move away from perhaps some of the more traditional energies which we know are contributing to um, energy sources which are contributing to um, climate change through greenhouse gas emissions. Make sure you've got an infrastructure and a network that allows you to exploit those new sources of energy um, and your research and development focuses on that. Work internationally with partners to ensure that there is stability in those regions where you need to draw energy from. Because even as America also becomes an e exporter of energy, there are certain natures you're still going to need. So therefore, you're still vulnerable. And many of those other stuff that you're doing within the country, particularly in fossil fuels, is a globalized market. So that has a bearing. And finally, work, and a, a lot of this is military, but not exclusively military, to make sure that those supply chains are, are there and they work, the, the sea routes and everything, in order that you remove some of that volatility that we see. But don't see the benefits you have today from shale gas, tight oil, as an excuse not to do anything. That is a wasted opportunity. Use that time, that breathing space it's given you, Take the benefits that Ralph talked about, the reduction in emissions between gas and coal, but continue the research and development, continue to push it to support the development of new industries. Because otherwise, what you've got is a short-term win and a real long-term problem. It is not something that's going to be there forever and a day. It's the same in the UK. We have everything between six months and 60 years of shale gas, depending on who you talk to. You have a population density of about 34 to the kilometre. We have somewhere in the region of 250. That is another 216 objections to why we won't have fracking in dense urban areas. But if we can get some of it in, in some of our less populated areas, we should do. But we only use it as a bridging fuel, not a replacement fuel. Thank you. Yes, please, Ralph. Well, now I know what Christian's complaining about. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Next time we'd have him go last. Yeah, 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 yeah. Morris said he goes last. Um, I just, uh, on the question of the, 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 of the plan, um, far less eloquently, I'd simply say I think part of, the, part of the answer should be some form of carbon tax. And I think the time now in the, in the near term when, when prices. Somebody agrees. <laughs> When uh, you didn't get to applause. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when prices now are, 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 are relatively low, this is a, a relatively easy time to do so and to set that in. It can be a low tax now. It can be something once you get on the table, once it's implemented, then a lot of your strategic options for the larger plan um, are come, come more uh, available. And on the question of uh, working with other governments and working with other countries and looking for a whole of government type approach, my experience. Um, and looking at climate security and climate policy and energy policy issues in Latin America leads me to believe there are a lot of countries, particularly those around the, in, 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 that are being impacted very severely, where the, it's not so much of a difficulty getting a whole of government effort in there uh, to them trying to work with outside groups to address the problems they face. They face, they face very difficult challenges and they're well aware of it. And it has now been they're accustomed to thinking about it and planning in a way it, it, it w to, to the capabilities they have um, more so than we are. So it depends certainly on the country. It cert depends certainly on, on, the, uh, uh, on, on their current political situation. But, uh, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there. In fact, usually my experience is some of these countries, Mexico, Colombia, there's several, a lot of Central American countries, they're ahead of us in, in identifying the problems. And this is not alone. This is through work with the United Nations in Empowerment Program and several other NGOs and groups and multilateral groups that have helped them think through these problems. They're well aware and they're ready to move ahead and they're actually doing so. We could find better ways of working with them. Yeah, Dan and then Cherry. Yeah, uh, two points from 
thoughts from DOD, let's put, let's put it that way. One is just a, a bit of a DOD anecdote on getting the, the story out, and, and Shari may remember the, the first part of this. So when I talk about these issues, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, we had a few interesting discussions there, including uh, a fairly large uh, conference that we attended. Uh, the reaction I often find myself getting when the Department of Defense is talking about energy and climate security is, why are you trying to militarize uh, en energy and climate uh, issues? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, despite my best efforts to talk about what a very small part, frankly, we are, but I think an important part uh, in the effort, uh, there is a very great concern with militarization uh, of these issues. Uh, the irony from my perspective in the U.S. Department of Defense is when I come back here and I talk about energy and climate change, I face great scrutiny on why I'm looking at energy and climate change. Uh, I have Hill staffers that are doing word searches for the words climate change in any document I do and then asking me to report on why uh, I'm doing that. And I see DOD announcements on breakthroughs in energy efficiency and initiatives in energy efficiency being, being greeted with uh, actually a fair amount of skepticism and criticism. Uh, despite, I think, the good work that's being done in those areas. So there are real challenges uh, for us. I mean, that's a, that's a bizarre DOD anecdote uh, to add to the probably many yeah. stories out there. But let's be uh, frank about that, that we need to find a way to uh, overcome these challenges. And I'm not talking about kind of bowling over those who have differing views, but really uh, coming to recognize the things that, quite frankly, and I think Ralph and, and Neil have put it quite well, uh, that quite uh, frankly should be unifying us on these particular issues, whether it's near-term practical uh, concerns uh, or the longer-term uh, issues that uh, I think we all need to be thinking about. I also wanted to quickly address the, the question about Asia. Uh, I said we in DOD are not terribly good at thinking about opportunities. We mostly think about threats, which is, is mostly true. Uh, but in this area, amongst a few others, we see some real ar areas of opportunity for cooperation and collaboration uh, in Asia. Uh, not only with our traditional allies and partners there, but including with countries like China, uh, where I do think there's increasingly shared perception and belief uh, that there are benefits in addressing these uh, issues. Uh, and I think there, real, there is real potential for us uh, to explore that. Thank you. Mary? On the telling the story better here in Washington, we increasingly find from the travels of our military advisory board, as Neil referred to, that they're engaging with communities at the local level, and they're hearing from mayors innovating in these areas across the country. The next step, logical step in this, would be to have more venues in, in the Washington area where mayors and local military leaders, like base commanders, can tell their stories of innovation from the local level. Those mayors are probably, to the extent they're telling their story in Washington, are doing it through forums not related to national security, you know, through Council of Mayors and other gatherings that local leaders would have. And that's good, but maybe there are further opportunities to do that. You know, David Stimson has very adeptly brought together um, leaders from South Asia and other parts of the world to tell their stories in various forms. I mean, there may, each of you who are working in think tanks may find opportunities to create venues better to tell those stories in Washington in, in a meaningful way. Um, on the whole of the sort of interagency cooperation and connecting with, with, the, uh, uh, with, with Asia, I would point to the example of Admiral Locklear, who's now the PACOM commander, Pacific commander, and who's been very outspoken about the importance of climate change as a security threat today in that region, and talked about the importance of working with partners across the region, uh, including with China, uh, on these whole set of issues. So it's happening today and uh, being taken seriously by current commanders. Thank you. Christian? If I may just add one, one very practical point is the, the EU delegation here in Washington also has a, a project with the Heinrich Böll Foundation, uh, which is the, the foundation of the, of the German Green Party, uh, which helps us to send American mayors and American farmers to Europe for a week of <coughs> sort of in-depth uh, embedding into working with a with a mayor or with other farmers to see how things get done uh, in Europe. And the idea is then that they get a chance to tell their story when they're over in Europe, but they also, when they come back, they get uh, a chance to tell the story of what they've seen 
to their community, to other mayors or to other farmers from their region. It's a, it's a project that uh, has been very uh, successful. It's certainly a text you have to bring over a lot of mayors and a lot of farmers to make a deep impact, but uh, it's, uh, it has had um, some, some good impact for us. Thank you very much. So let's open up the floor again. Lots more questions now. Okay, let's start. Uh, if we can start across here, then we'll come to the front here, and then we'll. Uh, James saying a question about Europe. You've talked about collaboration, and you also pointed out that the European economy has has some very large inhomogeneities in it, ranging from not so good to awful. Has there been any uh, consideration of using? Um, the uh, idea of uh, collaboration in energy and the diffusion of uh, energy innovation as a way of uh, getting money into the South, i.e., this is probably a good time to do infrastructure development in, in, this, in some of the more heavily impacted countries. And has, have people talked about that uh, as part of this crisis, an opportunity in this crisis? Great, thank you. We have a question here. Just behind you, Lauren. We'll take a few questions uh, as we wrap up. Thanks so much, Lisa Friedman from Climate Wire, and thank you for doing this. This has been really interesting. Um, two quick questions, if I could. One for Mr. Spock. You mentioned the the, the favoring a, a, cl a carbon tax. I was wondering if that's something that you think the that CNA, the Military Advisory Board, um, would endorse um, or has plans to endorse. Um, more broadly, I guess on the report, if someone maybe. Admiral Morissetti or others can talk about um, how this this um, plays into the broader climate change negotiations. Um, countries are in bond right now working towards a 2015 deal. One of the things that the U.S. is, <coughs> is advocating is that countries do what they can and, and that the mix of transparency and, um, um, and making sure that countries are really doing what they've done is going to be hopefully enough, and I'm wondering if you agree, disagree, um, and how you see that playing out. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Lisa. Great, thank you. Um, I think, did you, did you have your hand up? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael Lewis. I work at the Center for American Progress. Uh, I have a question for uh, Admiral Morissetti, uh, the bigger uh, picture question. You're framing this as an opportunity for transatlantic security, and I think that's a, that's a great idea. How does this relate to the fact that when we talk about hard security, the discussion is, is not as fruitful? Uh, the French and the Brits clinging to their uh, nuclear deterrence and thus undermining the capability of rapid deployment. The Germans seemingly not being able even to purchase uh, uh, five drones and put them into service. Uh, there, there's a lot of frustration, uh, not even speaking about NATO not being willing to, to plan for contingency vis-a-vis -vis Syria. Um, does this affect your program and, uh, and, and what's the relationship between these, these important and interesting issues and, uh, and the really hot questions? Great. So an, an interesting set of um, questions that we have on infrastructure development in uh, Europe, innovation infrastructure development, carbon tax, how does uh, the report fit into the climate change negotiations, Canada's role, and what does this mean as we uh, look at the challenges around questions of hard security. Um, so Ralph, I'm going to have you start. Don't worry, I'm going to laugh. Safer this way. Um, I'll speak to the question of the of, of, of the carbon tax for sure. I um, I just have to say I'm speaking for my own opinion there when I made that when they made that assertion, and I uh, I don't know if the if the military advisory board has plans to look at that issue or or um, speak to it in in an upcoming uh, publication or, or announcement. I may leave that to Sherry to respond to if she wishes. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, Christian. then. 
then I would take the question um, about uh, the infrastructure development uh, in in the European Union. As certainly, what what the European Union has always been very keen on has been uh, the big European corridors, whether it's on transport like high-speed rail connections, or on the energy side, uh, which are pipelines and especially interconnectors. So uh, one of the big projects of the European Union is to make the, the internal market work well also in the energy sectors is to build uh, even more interconnectors among pipelines to allow us within the European Union to move, uh, to move gas around uh, quickly, efficiently and also in case there are shortages in some parts of the European Union to be able to equal that out, given that we can get uh, gas from the north, from the south, uh, from the uh, from the east. Uh, interconnect is one important thing. Also, what we call the uh, reverse flows, being able to uh, use pipelines in in both directions to get the gas. So there are big uh, infrastructure pro um, projects going on. Then one one pipeline, which I think uh, I should mention because it's it's a very strategic European goal. It's the, it's the Southern Corridor, mm -hmm. which is about to, uh, to be decided soon on the European routes. This is uh, the project to bring gas from Azerbaijan through Turkey into Europe. And we are now waiting for a decision by the, the consortium, um, uh, the, the Chardonnay consortium, about which European routes uh, they want to use. One is a route uh, to southern Europe um, going uh, through Greece to Italy. The other one is, um, is uh, an Eastern European route going through Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary to Austria in the end. So there's a lot of sort of uh, projects uh, going on. So is, is the European philosophy, is, is it always been uh, every boy on its own bottom or have the richer countries been willing to subsidize the infrastructure development and yeah, I mean it's uh, it is it is all paid uh, from from the community budget, uh, into which every member state uh, contributes according to to its ability. So it's certainly that uh, that the that the richer countries pay more into the budget than the poorer ones. Mm -hmm. Sherry, do you um, want anything on the carbon tax? Please, the MAP has not taken a position on that issue. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dan. Let me take a stab at the question on the hard security, soft security uh, issues. And I'm not sure you'll find this a satisfying response, but you've highlighted exactly the kind of challenge we're facing right now, including inside the U.S. Department of Defense, with very strict fiscal uh, constraints. The choices are very stark, uh, and it's very difficult when uh, people are weighing a number of near-term, long-term, hard security, soft security uh, types of issues, not to mention the various interrelated other issues uh, when you get beyond, for example, alliance thinking and you start getting to national thinking, and obviously each of the member states has a number of domestic uh, issues they need to think through as they think through their fiscal constraints. So this makes it all very difficult. I think the only um, uh, way out of this, frankly, for all of us, is to remember that not all of this, you cannot, as, as uh, Neil was saying earlier, kind of stovepipe this into neat little zero-sum calculations. Uh, and breaking out of that is really critical for us, particularly in the long term, to get a better handle on these issues. If we're constantly making these short-term zero-sum calculations, uh, I think we might balance a budget for a year or two, but I'm not positive we'll find our way through not only a longer-term series of budgets, but a longer-term series of uh, challenges, and frankly, we'll miss a lot of opportunities in the meantime. If we can find a way to pull these together and say, so this is more of the totality of the types of challenges that we either as a country, as a member, or as a part of an alliance need to face, and we need to now get together and figure out how we can best contribute uh, our comparative advantages to this uh, and solve these problems over time, that's where I see kind of the way out of this. Uh, and I see the promising side is I see the beginnings of those discussions now. As I said, the uh, meeting I was at yesterday was exactly on this subject uh, for NATO. Some of the discussions I've had with the EU uh, offices over the past uh, year or so have been on similar uh, types of issues. But you correctly paint some of the very, very uh, uh, real examples of 
uh, how that's a hard choice right now, especially when people are dealing with very, very near-term crises uh, and issues. Thank you. Neil? Thank you. Um, which leaves Lisa's question on Canada. Um, I'll start with a position which many of you will have heard. So Roy was asking about Canada, and Lisa was also asking about the negotiations. Yeah. I'll start with something which I think many of you have heard from me before. It's not for one nation or a group of nations to tell another nation what to do. Nations must come to their own conclusion as to what their part is to play. But they've got to be realistic. They've got to see the context. They've got to understand exactly what the challenges we face and how we can, we can, get, we can benefit from the opportunities. Um, do what you can is fine, provided it's enough. At the end of the day, this is a risk management exercise. Exercise is perhaps too glib a term. It, it is about risk management. It's about getting down the level of emissions, getting down the way, the change in the way we behave to the point at which we can manage the risks posed by a changing climate. That requires action from everybody. It needs sufficient ambition and commitment, and it needs a willingness to be able to demonstrate that you are actually delivering against that ambition and commitment. The science tells us what's required. It's up to all of us and all our nations to work together to get us to the point where we can manage that risk effectively. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to address uh, Lisa's question on how this all fits in with the current climate change negotiations? I think I just did. Okay. <laughs> that, that, okay. And all right. Well, great. If, I, if I didn't, Lisa, come back and ask me again. <laughs> that, does that help? Okay, good. Nobody all right. <laughs> great. Well, um, typically what we will do is, um, as we've recorded this event, it will be posted on our website shortly, and we will write up an event summary of the discussion. So we would encourage you to have a look at our website at wilsoncenter.org and our blog at newsecuritybeat.org and to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to um, have a look again at the discussion. I'd like to thank you for uh, coming today and for um, participating, and to thank our panel uh, for a great, great discussion today. Thank you. <laughs> I need you as an agent. <laughs> when I get, when I get ten percent. <laughs> when I get paid, then we'll talk. <laughs> Right now, <laughs> yeah, very good questions. Yeah. Uh, let's talk again yeah. some, sometime after. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very well. Nice job. Maybe I can give you an update on what things are. It's good to see you. Yes. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. I think so. Yeah, I think that's it. I don't actually. I have to go get one myself because I only have a draft. But yeah, I think that's it. And then there should be like a little summary. So, okay, good. Well, um, you know, on that issue, we asked. If, you know, if you, if you can hold writing on it now, there might be more.